Morning, y'all. It's Lee Burns. We're excited today to welcome Stephanie Terry Farmer from the Georgia Historic Preservation Division. Um, I know that some of you've worked with Stephanie on local National Register nominations in your own Main Street communities, and you know her to be a dedicated preservationist improving Georgia downtowns through HPD programs. Stephanie joined the staff over at HPD in 2013 as the National Register Coordinator and Survey Program Manager, and she manages the division's National Register Program, the team of HPD staff responsible for getting Georgia's historic resources listed on the Georgia Register and the National Register of Historic Places. She also works with Environmental Review and the Tax Program staff regarding National Register eligibility concerns, <coughs> and she also oversees the important HPD survey program, coordinating diverse efforts to survey Georgia's historic resources. Prior to joining HPD, Stephanie was the Senior Programs Director and sole full-time staff of the Preservation New Jersey Incorporated, the statewide nonprofit historic preservation education and advocacy organization for New Jersey. We're really fortunate today to have her join us and agree to present to us on the National Register programs here in Georgia and on general level nationally. I want to thank you all for joining us virtually, and now I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Lee, and uh, I want to echo Lee and thank you all for joining us today and thank um, the Department of Community Affairs for allowing me to be with you today. I am really excited to um, be educating you a little bit about the National Register and the Historic Preservation Division, and I look forward to your questions at the end and having a little bit of virtual discussion. So um, I'm going to throw a lot of historic preservation stuff at you in a short amount of time. So. Um, Let's get things started. First, I want to give you just a little bit of background on the Historic Preservation Division. Um, we are within the, Depart the uh, Department of Natural Resources with the state of Georgia, and we administer a lot of federal programs that, um, that are administered in all states throughout the nation by a state historic preservation office. The National Register is one of those federal programs. Additionally, we administer environmental review and Section 106 review programs, grant and tax incentive programs, and the certified local government program. And we also house the Office of the State Archaeologist and their programs as well. So we have our hands in a lot of pots, frankly. Um, we do maintain a website that is chock full of preservation-related information with regard to, um, to all of the different programs that we do. So um, I just want to encourage you to think of our website as a good resource for all the work that you're doing in downtown. Anything that you can't manage to scribble notes on today, we have YouTube videos and handouts and um, brief web page documents on our website. So I encourage you to visit that whenever you get the chance. Um, so I've been doing uh, National Register and Historic Preservation work for a number of years now, and I have heard every myth in the book about what the National Register of Historic Places is. Mm -hmm. I have heard that if you list a property or district in the National Register, that the federal government then owns that property and is going to take it over and you no longer own it. I have heard that if you list a property in the National Register, you're going to be subject to all sorts of federal regulations and the President of the United States himself is going to dictate what color you paint your house. I have even heard that if you list your property in the National Register or a district in the National Register, you are going to be asked to dress up like these fine folks here on the slide in a bonnet and top hat weekly and welcome the public to your property. So I'm here today to tell you none of that is true. We're going to dispel some myths and uh, learn about what the National Register actually is and how it benefits and helps communities. So I'll begin with the origin for the National Register, which is maintained by the National Park Service within the U.S. Department of the Interior. In 1966, the United States Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act, which established many of our country's public historic preservation programs, including the National Register. The National Register was created by that act as our nation's official list of historic places considered worthy of preservation. And the National Register is an honorary recognition program that has the same standards nationwide. So anywhere you go in the country where you encounter a property that is listed in the National Register, that property has undergone the same scrutiny and has been subject to the same um, analysis throughout the country. The standards are the same all over the nation. 
The National Register is also a documentation process with the result that nominations form an important archive of America's historic built environment through written descriptions, histories, and photographs. And I encourage you to think of the Historic Preservation Division as a resource for this type of information in Georgia. If you are curious about a neighborhood or a building in your community, we maintain thousands of files that are open for public research, research uh, on buildings and uh, neighborhoods all over the state. So I encourage you when you're working in your communities, if you're interested in a building or want to know, it, has anyone ever done some research on this property, think of our office as a place where you might find that kind of stuff. And, and feel free to give me a call for that kind of information. So what makes a property eligible for the National Register? Well, in order to be listed in the National Register, a property or district must meet three tests or criteria. First, a property must usually be over 50 years of age, although this is not a hard and fast rule. Second, a property or properties within a district must generally have retained historic integrity. That is, a property must pretty much look the same today as it did in the past, uh, although, of course, the inevitability of change is accounted for, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And the third test is that a historic property or district must meet one or more of the four National Register criteria of significance listed here. These criteria are based on important themes in our nation's history. For example, early settlement, transportation history, community development, etc. However, it's important to understand that a property does not need to be nationally significant. Most of the nominations that we do here in Georgia are for resources that are significant locally or statewide. So they are, they are significant in the context of their community or in the state of Georgia. They don't necessarily have to rise to national significance. Additionally, the property does not have to be a building. The variety of what can be listed in the National Register is about as diverse as the variety of existing built resources. This variety includes houses, commercial buildings, community landmarks, agricultural buildings, additionally structures like bridges and rail lines, sites such as battlefields, cemeteries, and archaeological sites, and even objects such as sculpture, fountains, and funerary monuments. And in addition to individual resources, the National Register also lists historic districts. These are concentrated groupings of buildings, sites, structures, and objects that were related historically and are listed as a group. The most common type of historic district in Georgia is a residential neighborhood. And downtown commercial districts are also a very common type of historic district. And I think this is the type that would be most relevant to a lot of the work that you all are doing as Main Street managers. We have a lot of downtown commercial districts that are listed throughout Georgia. And uh, we're going to learn in a little bit about why you might want to think, if, if, you, if you're not already working in a community that has their downtown commercial area listed as a historic district, why you might want to think about pursuing that. There are some pretty substantial economic and investment benefits that come with being listed as a historic district. In Georgia, we do encourage the listing of historic districts when possible because more properties and property owners can benefit from National Register listing in one effort. All properties listed as contributing within a historic district receive the same recognition and benefits as if they were individually listed. So it's really more bang for your buck. If you're listing a historic district, you're listing hundreds and sometimes thousands of properties all under one nomination. That's the same amount of effort that you would have to go through if you were listing an individual building. So we encourage districts because we want to see more properties and property owners benefit. So you heard me use the term contributing properties. Uh, this has to do with the accounting for change that I talked about a little bit ago. All places change, and it's important to understand that the National Register program accounts for a degree of change. In the case of historic districts, just because an area includes altered or older buildings, or altered older or excuse me, altered older buildings, or even limited new construction, does not mean it does not qualify for the National Register. New construction or altered resources that are within a historic district will be classified as non-contributing to the district. They're within the district boundaries, 
but given this status to clarify that they lack the age or integrity to contribute to the district's significance. Basically, I want you to understand that uh, while an area does have to retain its historic integrity in order to potentially qualify as a historic district, it does not by any means have to look exactly as it did circa 1890, for instance. Here are some great shots of downtowns throughout Georgia that have changed substantially over time, yet are still listed in the Georgia and National Registers as historic districts. So now that we know what types of resources are found in the National Register, let's discuss what the National Register does and does not do and how it helps preserve historic resources. We discussed how the National Register results in an archive of America's built environment and also that it provides for a national standard for analyzing historic, historic resources. Additionally, the National Register benefits properties by identifying them for preservation considerations. This identification verifi verifies that indeed a place is historic and thereby informs the general public that this is a significant resource that the community cares about and that should be protected. So it really gives communities a leg to stand on in terms of historic preservation advocacy because if you've gone through the effort to nominate a property or district to the National Register, that place has been documented as historic. And it's not just that people are saying it's historic, in fact, it's been documented and certified by the federal government as an important historic resource. Additionally, by documenting historic properties and making that information available to the public, National Register listing helps ensure that these historic properties are taken into account in the planning of federally funded, licensed, or permitted projects, referred to as Section 106 of the 1966 Historic Preservation Act. For example, if the Georgia Department of Transportation wants to widen a road, they must take into account the effect that road widening will have on historic resources. And that's because the Georgia Department of Transportation uses federal funds and federal, federal permitting to complete road widening projects. So in the event that federal funds or permitting are going to impact a National Register listed district or property, that impact has to be taken, account, taken into account in the planning of a project. And while that won't necessarily stop the project, it does mean that if a project is going to have a negative impact on historic resources, that impact is going to have to be mitigated. So even if the project is allowed to proceed, there, there will have to be something given back to the community to account for and mitigate any damage that is done to historic resources. So what does the National Register not do? Well, first and foremost, National Register listing does not place any obligations or restrictions on the use of private property. It does not lead to public acquisition or require public access. It does not mean that the President of the United States is going to tell you what color to paint your house. Listing results in absolutely no restrictions on the treatment, use, transfer, or disposition of private property. It's local designation under your local zoning code that actually regulates and restricts how properties are treated and managed. And this is the most common misconception about the National Register. Most people think it, think it restricts what can be done to a property. It, in fact, does not. It does not, in, in that same token, then, it does not necessarily protect property. Properties are only protected via local designation under local zoning code. However, it's only through education and discussion with people in your communities that those people are going to understand what the, what the National Register does, and not only what it doesn't do, but how it can help them out. Essentially, the National Register creates preservation options, and it's up to Georgia's communities to engage and work, to work together to decide how to best use those options. So what are those options? National Register listing, in fact, offers a number of benefits. Of course, we already mentioned that the National Register provides recognition. But did you know that National Register listed districts attract heritage tourism? And National Register listing has been shown to stabilize property values and incentivize good property stewardship simply by making people proud of their neighborhood and proud of its historic integrity. However, the number one benefit afforded to owners of property listed in the Georgia and National Registers of Historic Places is tax incentives to help support revitalization. 
My office administers three historic preservation tax incentive programs for Georgia. These are the Federal Rehabilitation Investment Tax Credit Program, the State Income Tax Credit for Rehabilitated Historic Property, and the State Preferential Property Tax Assessment for Rehabilitated Historic Property. First up, a little on the Federal Rehabilita Rehabilitation Investment Tax Credit. <laughs> only, th this is only available to income producing or commercial properties and it is valued at 20% of rehabilitation expenditures. And it is a credit, not a deduction. So it's a dollar for dollar match in credit. So basically this means that if an investor is interested in purchasing and rehabilitating a building in your community, and that building is listed in the National Register or is contributing to a National Register listed district, that investor can potentially offset 20% of their rehabilitation costs as a credit on their federal income taxes. Here's a case study in downtown Covington. This is the Delaney Hotel before and after rehabilitation. The owner spent over $1 million in rehabilitation expenses converting this former hotel into office space. And that means that use of the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credit offset approximately $200,000 of this project's rehabilitation expenses. Locally, these projects are not only good in and of themselves, but they serve as catalysts for broad-scale reinvestment. Projects like this inspire others to invest in the block in the neighborhood, and that's the beginning of attracting the critical mass needed for downtown revitalization. Often, you see one project like this in a downtown or in a neighborhood, and it sparks a whole mass of projects just because people now see revitalization is happening and they are interested in being part of a wave of revitalization. Next program is the Georgia Income Tax Credit for Rehabilitated Historic Property. And this is offered to both residential and commercial properties in Georgia. And this credit can offset 25% of qualified rehabilitation expenditures via a credit to your state income taxes. It is capped at $100,000 for a primary residence, and it was capped last year at $300,000 for a commercial property. But this year, legislation went into effect that raised that cap from $300,000 per project to $5 million per project. So we have a lot of opportunity now to see, much, to see projects um, that are much larger in scale actually be able to be accomplished because they are now economically viable because the cap has been raised. So again, potential to, to, to reap a $5 million credit in, as a credit to your state income taxes to offset rehabilitation costs. You can imagine the kind of economic investment that that incentivizes from major developers all over the country and why they may now be interested in coming to Georgia because they can potentially undertake some really massive projects that would not have been economically viable before. And I think two, two key things to remember about the, uh, federal and the federal tax credit program is that it is a tool for residential properties that can, excuse me, the state tax credit program. It is a tool for, federal, for residential properties that cannot benefit from the federal credit. And it can be paired with the federal credit on commercial properties. So in the case of a commercial property rehabilitation for a building that is listed in the National Register, you can potentially take both the state and federal credit and offset 45% of rehabilitation costs. Here's an exemplary, exemplary small rehabilitation project in Savannah that took advantage of the state, state tax credit. And I like to highlight Savannah because we do a lot of work with them, not only because they have an incredible historic building stock, but because the city and county tax office really works to support the tax credit programs and has put a lot of effort into advising applicants about their availability and working with them. A lot of people don't understand that these programs even exist. So it really comes down to leadership like you all to help educate communities and understand that these programs are out there. And Savannah has done that very well. In this case, uh, at 1721 Habersham Street, this property took advantage of all three tax credit programs offered through our office. So they paired the federal and state credits, and they secured the county assessment, uh, county property tax assessment freeze, which we're going to discuss momentarily. 
Additionally, you can't really talk about preservation tax credits in Georgia right now without talking about Pont City Market in Atlanta, which just opened last year. This is a massive project with 2.1 million square feet. This building is the largest brick structure in the South, and it is also one of the largest urban redevelopment projects underway. It has pumped $280 million of reinvestment into this area and added to this area's revitalization. It's also been a massive catalyst. Again, these projects are not good just in and of themselves, but they are good for the communities as a whole. In, for example, in the two years before the developer acquired this former Sears Roebuck Company building, two building our permits were issued in nearby neighborhoods. Just two years after the acquisition of this building by the developer, 38 building permits were being issued annually in the same area. So again, when people begin to see reinvestment, Others begin to jump on board, and it really begins that revitalization wave that a lot of you are working very hard to make happen in your downtowns. Again, the uh, Pont City Market Project paired the federal and state credits, and they also took advantage of the state preferential property tax assessment for rehabilitated historic property, known for short as the property tax freeze. This third program allows an inv a, a person who has, is rehabilitating a historic building to freeze their county property taxes, taxes at the pre-rehabilitation level for nine and a half years. And this is actually transferable to new owners. So you'll see a lot of people that will purchase the property, rehabilitate the property, own the property for the number of years required to secure the federal and state tax credits, and then sell the property. But that property will still have four and a half to five years of county property tax abatement that they can use to attract a new buyer because that property tax assessment is transferable and it stays with the building. So not only does it benefit them for the amount of time that they as the investor own the property, it's an incentive to attracting a, a new owner when they want to sell the property. So I know I've gone through a lot of stuff. Uh, again, I encourage you to visit our website because you can find much more in-depth information on these tax credit programs on HPD's website. Because anyone who uses these is receiving a financial benefit through the IRS or the Georgia Department of Revenue, they will have to follow preservation standards if they choose to use these incentives. So if you choose to pursue tax credits, you are going to have to do work that is historically appropriate. But these are optional programs, and they are a great financial incentive that only properties and districts that are listed in the National Register can take advantage of. So they are really the number one reason to encourage property owners to pursue National Register listing in your community. In Georgia, properties are listed in the National Register through the Historic Preservation Division, but nominations come from the public, not from our staff. We try to have a very user-friendly program that encourages nominations from the public, and we are always available to provide guidance and assistance. The nominations we receive are generated from local interest, and our staff's role is to facilitate the process and to help complete the paperwork according to NPS standards. Just a note on owner approval. Individual National Register listings require owner approval, so you cannot list a proper, an individual property in the National Register without the approval of the property's owner. For districts, it's a little different. According to federal regulations, a district cannot be listed if a majority of the property owners within that district object to the listing via certified letter. So basically, I want you to understand that if you are interested in pursuing a National Register district listing in your community, you're not going to have to get every single owner of every property in that district to officially approve. What you're going to have to do is enough groundwork and legwork to educate owners up front so that a majority of them do not formally oppose. The burden is on the opposition. Before we wrap up, I do want to walk you through the National Register process so that you'll better understand how nominations come together. The process for listing anything in the National Register begins with a sponsor. That's someone, a member of the public or an organization perhaps, that takes on the responsibility of nominating the property or district. A nomination is written and researched and is then submitted to our office, along with photographs, maps, and other supporting information. Some nomination sponsors hire consultants to complete this process, but this is not required. 
our National Register staff will review the information and usually reply back with questions, suggestions, or comments, depending on what additional information we may need. After our National Register staff has determined that a district or property meets the National Register criteria that we discussed and is documented to National Register standards, then the nomination is scheduled for our Georgia National Register Review Board, which is, uh, th th that is a board of appointed preservation professionals that meets two times a year to review nominations. Once approved by the review board, the final nomination form is completed by our staff and forwarded to the National Park Service in Washington, D.C. The keeper of the National Register at the National Park Service has final approval, and at the point that the keeper approves the nomination, that property is officially listed in the National Register. For the statewide perspective, in Georgia, there are presently over 2,100 listings in the National Register, and this includes 485 historic districts. There are also numerous nominations currently in progress. So for a grand total, statewide there are over 80,000 properties in Georgia currently listed in the National Register. So I'd like to wrap up with a little bit of imagery. You know, let's face it, preser historic preservation can be a very tough sell. When people look at projects from an outside perspective, they don't always have the information or understanding necessary to see past the challenges. People often ask, isn't it just too expensive? Isn't the building too far gone? Why not just tear it down and start over? Why should I save it? It is at that point where tools such as the tax incentives that we discussed can help people see an opportunity as opposed to just a challenge. These incentives give property owners a more economically viable option to help preserve the resources that create your community's shared sense of place, such as this house. Here is a photo of that same residence you just saw after a rehabilitation where the property owner used rehabilitation tax credits. Because of private, the private investment leveraged by the tax credits, this historic property was returned to the tax rolls and irreplaceable community character was retained. I encourage you as leadership in your communities to be well versed in these incentives and in the National Register as these are really just waiting to help spur and support revitalization in your community. It's up to those of us on the front lines to promote these incentives as tools and help incentivize new investment and rehabilitation that celebrates our community character by making sure that current and potential property owners and our community leadership are aware of and actively promoting and using these tools. To learn more about the National Register process and recent nominations in Georgia, you can always head over to our website and you can sign up as well for our monthly e-newsletter, which includes articles about upcoming training and educational opportunities, historic properties, archaeology, and all manner of preservation efforts in Georgia. And you can also find the Historic Preservation Division through social media and on license plates throughout the state. So please get in touch with us and let us know what we can do to help you with preservation in your communities. And now I'd like to open it up for discussion. What can I answer for you? Hey y'all, we're going to go ahead and take some questions. This is Lee. Um, I'm going to start, let's see, bear with me with technology a little bit. Um, let's see, what's the first one, Jessica? Uh, it's about the Georgia Income Tax Credit. Can, I, can it still be taken after work has been done if it was listed on, listed on the historic district and they did not contact you prior to rehab? The answer to that question is generally yes. What you will want to do, there is a, a statute of limitations is really the best term, and that, that statute varies on the nature of the property and the nature of the project. So I would encourage you, if you are aware of a project that has already been completed, to get in touch with Carol Moore, our office's tax incentives and grants coordinator, as soon as possible, because they're going to have to put in that application 
within a certain amount of time of completing the project. And there are also implications what, as to whether or not they've put the building in use or not or gotten a certificate of occupancy. So, so basically, there's, there's a lot of stuff involved, but it is possible to still get the tax credits after a rehabilitation has been completed. Contact our office to figure out how to get that process started. And the next question is from Carla Weaver. Um, what was the third tax incentive program that Stephanie discussed? The third tax incentive was the preferential property tax assessment that allows a, a, a property owner that has uh, pursued a rehab on a historic property to also apply to freeze the county property taxes at the pre-rehabilitation level for nine and a half years. So you've got the state tax incentive program, which is a credit for rehab, the federal tax incentive program, which is a credit for rehab, and then this third county property tax assessment that freezes your county, county property taxes at the pre-rehab level. I have a follow-up question for that, Stephanie. Sure. Um, is there anything that they have to do on the local level for that property freeze? Mm -hmm. It, it varies by community, but generally no, because you're, you're, you will work with your, with your county tax assessor. It's just a matter of filing paperwork. There's no additional local regulation or zoning. The property does not have to be locally designated. Perfect. Um, the next question is from Randy. Uh, we're a fairly new Main Street community. We have a downtown district that is already registered on the National Register. Several of the buildings are vacant. We're working on local codes and ordinances to enforce the building codes. Many of the building codes are deteriorating. Many of the buildings are deteriorating, and the owners have shown little interest in preserving them or bringing them up to any safe and retainable standard. What should we keep in mind as we move forward? There's a lot of questions in this question. Um, let me see. Let me skip ahead a little bit. Several of the buildings are vacant. We're working on codes and ordinances to enforce the building codes. Many of the buildings are deteriorating. Wait, maybe it looks like it just came. Okay, okay just came through yeah. twice. So, what can <laughs> Stephanie's going to answer that for you? Um, I think what you need to, it's great to see that, to hear that you are working on local codes and ordinances, because as we have discussed, the National Register is not going to protect properties, and it does not mandate that property owners maintain their properties to any standard. Only local codes can do that. So I think what you could keep in mind in moving forward is that as you work to ensure that your code enforcement is doing everything they can to stay on top of these property owners and encourage them to be better stewards. Simultaneously, they can, um, they can be hearing about the tax incentives and understand and, and, and be educated as to, fa as to the fact that there is an economic incentive for them to either attempt to sell their properties to someone who may be better stewards or to pursue a rehabilitation that would um, that would would bring the properties up to a rentable standard and put the property back on the tax rolls and additionally would get would get the properties to a point where they're being better stewarded. I think if you can educate these property owners about potential financial incentives at the same time that you are telling them that, that they need to better steward their properties, hopefully they'll be a lot more receptive to that message. But I know that, that is a that's a tough um, equation. And, um, and I applaud you for working hard with local codes because that, that's really where that enforcement angle is. The next question is from Brian. Um, how can we find consultants to assist with the district registry process? Uh, our website has a recommended consultant list that is available to the public. Um, it is uh, linked to our front page. If you go to the Historic Preservation Division's website, there is a consultant's directory tab in the top right menu where you can click on, uh, you'll just click on consultant's directory and um, a bevy of consultants that are familiar with everything from actual craftsmanship work to National Register nomination will appear. And if you have any um, questions about which one to choose or, or um, if you want to talk to me about it, I'd be happy to. So please feel free to give me a call if I can help you through that. Um, the next question is from Celeste. Is property freeze residential or commercial or both? The property tax assessment freeze is for both residential and commercial properties. And Hilda wants to know what is the best way to get started on a district? Give me a call. Um, we have a preliminary application which allows you to fill out a little bit of information that will allow my staff to get a feel for whether or not we think you have an eligible district. Basically, does your community retain enough integrity to potentially be nominated? That's a pretty simple application, 
and that's available on our website, but I encourage you to give me a call. We can talk about how to fill that out and then what the next steps would be depending on what we find. Um, the next question is from Catherine. It's a great question. How long does the nomination process typically, ta typically take from submission until notification that the property was or was not listed? At this point, we're running at about a three-year timeline, which I know sounds extensive, but I want you to understand that the nomination process is pretty much entirely dictated by how long the nomination itself takes to complete. And that goes to the question about consultants, really. You know, if you are if you are able to hire a consultant or if there is a dedicated volunteer that is able to really own that nomination process, it will move much more quickly because they're able to do the research, research much more quickly and communicate with our office consistently. Most of the nominations that take a lot longer are, um, are nominations where they were being completed by volunteers and the volunteers simply could only work on them every once in a while. So that nomination process can move much more quickly. It's also going to depend on whether or not you're doing a property or a district because it takes a lot longer to research and record a district than it does an individual property. So, you know, it depends generally three years at this point, but we can work with you. Uh, the next question is from Kira about contact email. If you go to our um, calendar on georgiamainstreet.com, Stephanie's full bio is there and her contact information. Let's see what other questions we have, y'all. Should we keep, what should we keep in mind as we move forward? Oh, that's still Brandy's question. I think we went over that one. Um, can Stephanie expand on the overall cap of $25 million in credits statewide annually for income producing properties. That's from Connie up in Tacoa. Yes. So the new legislation that upped the state tax credit cap from 300000 per project to $5 million did also include a $25 million annual aggregate cap statewide for credit. So that basically means that while they're going to allow us now to provide $5 million, up to $5 million per project in credit, you're not, we're not going to be able to have in the state of Georgia aggregate more than $25 million in credit annually. So essentially, if there are five $5 million projects going on in the state of Georgia, that's, that's the maximum amount of projects that can happen that are at that $5 million level. However, projects that are, that are worth below $300,000 in credit are not subject to that cap. So smaller projects, there's no cap, there's no limit on those. That $25 million in aggregate credit is only, um, is only applicable to projects that are seeking to take more than $300,000 in credit. So think of that as a big cap from big, big, big projects. Smaller projects are not impeded by that cap. Thanks. That's a great question, Connie. Um, the next question is from Lorraine. Will this program be printable later for use in our cities? Um, Stephanie, can you get that in the accurate? Could you get it to me in a PDF? Absolutely. Out? Yeah, we'll upload a PDF image so you can print that out, Lorraine. That won't be a problem. Uh, let's see. Chantel has a question. Down to Tabby, what are the benefits to having a local historic district for potential national individual listings? Um, a local historic district provides regulation. So if you have a local historic district, you are able to regulate how properties are maintained and how properties are stewarded within that district. If you are able to do that, you're going to uh, theoretically have a great deal more properties within that local district that could potentially pursue um, national register listing. That's because you're going to be assuring that there is maintenance in integrity within that historic district. However, the struggle with individual listings is that individual listings have to not only have integrity, they also have to be significant. So really where the local historic district relates more to the National Register is that if you have a local historic district, you have a better potential that that district also qualifies for the National Register because you've already identified the district as significant and there's already a boundary established there. 
you're regulating how those properties are stewarded within that district. So in all likelihood, enough of those properties are being stewarded well that you have enough integrity to also list that district in the National Register. So the district, it's more how do districts relate to one another as opposed to how do district and individual listing relate to one another. I hope that answers your question. I know that gets a little confusing, but I'd be happy to talk with you more, Chantal. Let's see. Um, we covered the approximate time to complete the process. Um, uh, Celeste, you'd like to know, is Carol Moore the contact for beginning the rehab process in a designated historic district? Yes, she is. She's the one who can start you off on the tax credit application process. And I just want to jump in real quick with something here that I failed to clarify that is very relevant to this question. Everyone should understand that while a property does have to be listed in the National Register to take the tax credits, tax credit rehabilitation work can begin before a property is listed or a district is listed. You can complete rehabilitation simultaneous to National Register nomination. So if you've got a building in your community that you really want to see rehabbed and you've got an investor interested now and he wants to invest now, but the building is not listed yet, don't despair. That's really how the tax credit program is set up. The first part of the application is, uh, is where um, eligibility for the National Register is verified. So you can potentially not have the building listed yet, pursue the whole nomination process, that three-year three on average process, simultaneous to when the building is actually undergoing rehab. National Register nomination should not um, uphold rehabilitation work that's ready to go. Let's see. I think that's all our questions. Um, we really, really appreciate all your good questions, your feedback. Um, you know, every time we do a presentation, uh, preservation related around the state, so much of the core of our questions are about the National Register. And we really appreciate Stephanie coming today to talk to us about the program. Again, you can follow up with her. And you can see here on the screen, georgiashippo.org is their website. We also encourage you to follow them on Facebook, on Twitter. Flickr, and they also have a separate YouTube program where you can visit and see other presentations. We will upload this presentation to our YouTube website, and Stephanie will share it on theirs. Please feel free to call us with any questions following the presentation, and we again, we just want to thank Stephanie, and also thank all of y'all for joining us today. Thank you all.